Hello, welcome to Cross Currents, produced by the City of Fort Collins in cooperation with the Larimer County League of Women Voters. I'm Barbara Rutstein, the moderator of today's program. Our topic is a shot in the arm, the vaccination debate. When a measles outbreak started last December in Disneyland and 147 people were infected in six states as well as Mexico and Canada, there was a huge public outcry in the country about how and why this could happen in the United States. It turns out that worldwide there are hundreds of thousands of measles cases each year and 150,000 people die of the disease yearly. Yet in 2000, the Center for Disease Control said measles was eliminated from the United States. Many wonder how this outbreak could happen. But in an interconnected world, if people do not get vaccinated, it will happen according to public health officials. Here in Colorado, we have a particularly low rate of vaccination for children entering kindergarten. In fact, we are either last or next to the last in vaccination rates. The question is why? Are vaccinations too expensive? Or are there too many exemptions for a variety of reasons? Or do a number of people believe vaccinations are not effective or safe? To explore this, we have on my right, Chantal Fev, a parent. On her right is Katie O'Donnell, public information officer for the Larimer County Department of Health and Environment. On her right is Leslie Botha, a concerned citizen. And on her right is Donna Sullivan, a medical faculty, uh, a medical doctor in the faculty Family Physicians of Fort Collins Family Medicine Center. Welcome to you and to our studio and viewing audiences. Let's start our discussion with you, Leslie. Why do you think there is a debate about vaccinations? Well, I've, I have to tell you all, it's been my policy not to talk about vaccines, politics, or religion in public. <laughs> so here I am at a nonpartisan women's organization in a government building, and if there's a member of the clergy out there, I'm really done. <laughs> but I don't think this issue really is about vaccines, and that's why I'm here. It's about medical freedoms. Vaccines are an env environmental toxin. Anything that we put into our body can be classified as an environmental toxin, and there, and there is a spectrum, obviously, of course. Vaccines contain neurotoxins. One in 68 kids in this country has autism. One in 45 kids in New Jersey has autism. One in 22 boys in New Jersey has autism. Dr. Stephanie Seneff, who is, a, who is with a MIT, a researcher, has just published a paper looking at Monsanto's Roundup uh, and glyphosate uh, that we all spread readily on our lawns. And people who are exposed to glyphosate are exhibiting similar symptoms of autism. She has just made the dire prediction that by the year 2025, one in two children will have autism. Birth control pills have been linked to autism. Gesta gestational diabetes has been linked to autism. Until we understand why and what, we need to be very cognizant about the amount of toxins, not only that we are exposed to, because it builds up in each generation, but the amount of toxins that our children are being exposed to. When I was born in 1953, the amount of toxins was, a, uh, the amount of vaccines was a lot less than what they were today. We had 20 uh, vaccines. Today, kids, have 49 vaccines. We have 68 vaccines by the time we are adults. Okay, let's see. I see some disagreement here. Donna? 
I would really like to see your data that supports your statistics because I do not agree with them in any way in terms of the incidence of autism. And there's very clear data that um, vaccines are not associated with causing autism. In addition, there are a number of other toxins far more dangerous than vaccines that people are exposed to all the time, not the least of which is marijuana, especially in this state that people are exposing their children to. But there are lots of other things that cause harm far more dangerously and far higher incidence than vaccines. The other side of that is vaccines have very clearly proven to prevent disease that causes harm to our children at a far higher incidence than the adverse effects that have ever been reported from any vaccine. But have vaccine. we traded uh, infectious disease for chronic disease? That is the question. And my data on autism is on the CDC website. This is from their 2010 analysis, which was released last year. 2010, folks, 1 in 68. What year is this? We do not have 1 in 68 children in our school system who have autism. But I don't have, I have not got the information to refute you because that wasn't something I was looking at. But there are different populations. Why is it right. 1 in 22 in New Jersey? Mm -hmm. Well, the only thing that I know is I watched Frontline, and they <laughs> said there were 12 studies that showed that autism was not caused by vaccines. Very clear data. I have a copy of yes. a 2002 study mm -hmm. Uh, that says that says there needs to be more research linking vac or between vaccines and autism. I have that with me tonight. Also, we have a CDC whistleblower, Bill Thompson, who is uh, willing to testify in front of the Senate or in, in a t uh, Senate testimony hearing before Congress. Uh, Congressman Bill Posey was in. in uh, instrumental in getting FOIA uh, documents, CDC internal documents, through the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, the whistleblower, uh, Bill Thompson, agreed and stated and is willing to testify that the CDC was well aware of a link in MMR autism and African American boys if they had the MMR vaccine at 36 months. Okay, so, let's go to the health department. <laughs> what is your experience? Uh, we're going to say the same thing that we, um, you know, the autism research that we've heard about for so many years has been proven invalid. Um, there hasn't been a link as far as the immunization to an autism reaction. And, um, you know, the research that continues to come out and that we keep track of has shown time and time again that there isn't that link. Um, the timing of when autism tends to show up in a child's brain chemistry and when vaccinations occur, um, according to the recommended schedule, can often be very similar. And so there's speculation that that's the tie, and it's not basically the tie to immunization or the vaccinations for MMR specifically. So we don't necessarily um, you know, know 100%. We're never going to know 100%, but um, we definitely don't see the autism tie to the the immunization. And what kind of questions do you get from parents? Oh, we get everything from parents. Um, well, what are their concerns when they come in? Well, we don't necessarily deal with a lot of what the school districts do. We hear a lot of those comments. Um, a lot of parents concerned about, um, you know, all the vaccines at once, and they've kind of lumped a lot of the vaccines together so that they don't have to go in constantly and get a lot of those vaccines many, many times. So. Um, a lot of parents just don't have the, I'd say they have the misinformation. They have mm -hmm. a lot of the speculation that they do their own online research. They have a social circle that believes one way or another. They find a lot of the data um, tied back to celebrity news and media, um, hyped media. And so a lot of it for us is the education component. We believe it's safe. We believe it's needed and necessary to protect their children. And oftentimes, as long as you talk and explain and have that conversation, they're very supportive. Okay, I have a question, and maybe the doctor or you can answer it. When they say that children have 36 vaccine or 36 vaccines, I think by the time they're six years old, do you give uh, a shot for each one, or is it are they, they combined? A number of the vaccines are in combination format. Um, and actually, if you look at the number of antigens or things that will trigger an immune response, 
in, even in the combination vaccines that have the most vaccines in it, it is far less than one day at daycare in terms of the antigens, the toxins, the infectious potential, far less than going to the grocery store, going to church, touching any handrail that other people have touched. The vaccines have much less potential cause of harm than exposures in many other venues. Okay, Chantal, I know you want to jump in. Yeah, because you, you, uh, your question is, why is there this debate? I don't think that this conversation amongst parents is necessarily because of autism at this point in time, because, you know, research has been done and people look a little bit further than just the autism. What I as a parent would like to see is proper research that actually combines, that compares uh, vaccine, ch vaccinated children with non-vaccinated children over a longer period of time. Because I believe this debate is going on because there's a lot of mis trust mm -hmm. and that can be misinformation but it can also be with not trusting the information that is provided I have had the experience myself as a new parent starting vaccinations um, that I would go to the to the Larimer County Health Department and my child would not even be checked for a temperature where I did my information I was like well if your child's a little bit sick you should postpone your vaccination by by a few days if you can and that those kinds of things do not me as a parent not give me a lot of confidence that somebody else is going to make the right decision for my child I would not give my child a hepatitis B vaccination at age two days. To, to, that makes no sense to me. That creates no trust for me. I can understand that there are certain circumstances that it might be appropriate to do that, but not for the entire community. So the fact that the general standard is do this for everybody makes me feel obliged towards my children to be a critical thinker and you know, within myself and within my family debate about every single vaccination. Does that make sense? It's not, I don't sure, feel like there's a, a black... a consideration. And I feel like there's no black and white in this mm -hmm. whole story. I feel like there's a large gray area where a lot of parents are, and it could be a little bit more towards vaccination or not vaccination, but there's, it's very hard to find that information in that gray area. That is correct. A lot of that information is in medical literature, not in public literature. Um, there are a number of resources across the country that have endeavored to to make that information much more understandable. Um, the CDC, however contentious it may be in some circles, has a lot of very valid parent-oriented information material. The American Academy of Pediatrics has parent-minded materials, American Academy of Family Physicians. Um, we have a number of organizations just in Colorado. And for those of you that are here, there's a little resource with online um, legitimate resources. But even if it's to immunize.org, or um, the, the state health department, the CDC um, state health and wellness um, website. Are they um, gonna explain why to give a hepatitis mm -hmm. B shot to a baby? Would you like an answer for that? Yeah, I would. Okay. Sure, I think lots of people would, that's fine. We did not initiate immunizing infants for hepatitis B until sometime in the last eight to 10 years because the data had started to come out that was different than what we expected. Um, it, had been, it had been demonstrated that hepatitis B generally is communicated through exchange of body fluids. Um, and what we found was that there was a surprisingly high number of children who were infected with hepatitis B who we didn't have an explanation for. Um, some of the speculation for that is that we, don't, we check women for infection with hepatitis B, but early in their pregnancy, not at the end of the pregnancy. So we have a huge population we actually aren't even screening who are potentially infected and don't know it at the end of their pregnancy. Um, and even in those populations where that was controlled, the children in daycare had a higher incidence of hepatitis B infection that could not be explained in any other way. So from a population standpoint, the intention to protect infants from getting it in ways we don't understand yet um, what it was generated as a policy to protect them because the vaccine itself is um, very benign. It is uh, engineered. It's not a particular chemical. It doesn't come from people with hepatitis B. Um, the intention being that um, if an infant gets hepatitis B, they can be profoundly ill and die from the infection. 
And the incidence was enough to justify protecting our children as a population when we had yet to be able to explain and still don't have an ability to explain why those children were getting it. You know, and, and your valid are, uh, are, are, uh, your arguments are, or your reasons are valid, of course. However, another one of my concerns is, is that 54% of our kids are chronically ill. Um, our immune systems are changing with each generation. We're no longer aging, we're disintegrating <laughs> because we're not getting enough nutrients from our foods, from our soils, and we are getting bombarded in so many different directions from so many toxins in our lives. We have to really question, and each birth is different. The preemie unit over here at Poudre Valley Hospital has phenomenal numbers, and they're adding more beds. Uh, emergency rooms across the country are being prepared, are preparing now for more pediatric emergency cases. What happened to our healthy children? What happened to our healthy children? Yes. How many people are still smoking? I How agree. many toxins are released every mean, time someone blows out cigarette I smoke? Agree. How, How many, many people are giving their children marijuana brownies? How many people are not washing their hands regularly? How many people are traveling and being exposed to that's an impossible exposures one. all over that's, we've got the people, world. tourists coming into Fort mm -hmm. Collins in Estes Park, Larimer County, all summer long. We've got kids coming to Colorado State University from different countries exactly. that we're going to be vaccinated against them doesn't make any sense at all. We're the ones that are actually more contagious because a lot of the vaccines that we get contain live viruses and they shed. The measles epidemic at Disneyland wasn't an epidemic. We've had 600 cases of measles in this country at one time and that was only a few years ago. The measles vaccine sheds. That's what happened at Disneyland. And if you watch what's going on with the vaccine issue, we had Ebola. We were all pulling our hair over Ebola. We had the flu vaccine. We had the flu vaccine. We had epidemics of flu. The flu mist for kids is a shedding vaccine. Okay, they can sneeze. you get sick from that? Yeah, you can get sick from that. Well, who knows? whether the measles vaccine was not brought from abroad. Does anyone know? The, not the, the measles, measles vaccine, vaccine. The measles, the measles, the measles virus. infection. It's called measles Mary. We don't know who she is. <laughs> <laughs> there are actually very few of our vaccines are live vaccines. Most of oh, them are either right engineered. Here. We've got yes. MMR, there are there are vaccine, four. chicken pox vaccine, mm -hmm. Proquad, the rotavirus vaccines, Rotatech and Rotarix and flu mist, the nasal spray flu vaccine. And by the way, the flu vaccine this year given to adults was not effective. Well, uh, GlaxoSmithKline just recalled 1.7 million vial doses, or million vials, uh, because of lack of potency. But we were all told, well, it's not gonna be effective this year because the strains have mutated, but get your vaccine anyway. So what concerns me about that is that, you, in my opinion, there's like a, a kind of a fake uh, believe that people are protected. The result is that people get their vaccinations maybe as children and that they do not build immunity for the rest of their life, but they do not go back and get their boosters. So you basically push out getting the childhood diseases from getting them during childhood to getting them later in life, which is potentially much more dangerous than going through, through my childhood. So it's like, to me, it's like a, a, it's a fake way It's an of artificial immunity. Actually, um, there have not been incidences of increased rate of disease in people who have been immunized even in childhood, um, especially relative to measles. Most of us in my age group actually had measles, um, and so our immunity is lifelong. And then those who were immunized subsequent to the 1960s were exposed to less, but we have not had any increase in number of adults who are developing measles, who were vaccinated only as children. Katie, do you have that in uh, the health department? Do you see adults coming in with measles and other diseases that they may have had immunizations not, for? Not consistently. I think more of us, more of the, the ones that we see are the children and the children who skipped the immunizations or did staggered immunizations. We don't have a lot of adult cases. How about outbreaks at colleges around the country once in a while? We had one here not too long ago, which 
which outbreak? Man, uh, uh, meningitis? Meningococcal? The meningi meningitis, The meningitis, right? right here. In those who were not immunized. Is that Against right? Meningococcal meningitis. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And now, do you does the health department give those um, inoculations? Yeah. And when we have an outbreak like that, we step in and help immunize as many students as we can, just to try to prevent that spread. Okay. You, you know, I would love to have coffee with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not going to do that I'm now. Not, we're going to no. do that I, later. I, I so I, I have a question for you. I would love you. to accept what you were saying, but until we really know, until our government steps forth and does a vaccinated versus unvaccinated study, we're not going to know if, if, if our kids are healthier getting vaccinated than not getting vaccinated. And Colleen Boyle with the CDC admitted in a Senate testimony hearing in front of Bill Posey, Congressman Bill Posey from Florida, when he asked her, has there been a study done? And her response has been no. Let's end well, this. You're, you're making debate. global applications to certain vaccines and certain diseases. I'm talking let, about a Senate okay. testimony here. Study. Let, let me give you a very classic example. When I was in my specialty training in the early 80s, Haemophilus influenza caused meningitis um, in a number of children. And I was in Dayton at the time at Dayton Children's in January. Dayton Children's at the time was a 250 bed children's hospital. We had so many children infected with H flu, meningitis that we had cribs out in the hallways. It was overflowing. One in 10 infants died and many of them had permanent deafness related to that and or some other potential impairment in their um, ability to learn um, and to have cognitive function. We created a vaccine for that in the late 80s, and now we almost never see H flu infection at all. We clearly, clearly have saved thousands if not millions of children's lives by creating a vaccine within the last 30 years. You know, I've done a lot of research myself and um, have talked with microbiologists. Um, and viruses have a life cycle. Wait, I'm going to interrupt you because I have other issues I oh, want to get to. That's right, you do. So, all right, I'll end it there. My prerogative. <laughs> uh, first of all, let's talk about what vac vaccinations are recommended for children start, that start kindergarten. What are they? Let's do with, let's do the health department. I'm not going to know off the top of my head. She's going to know. Oh, okay. So all of our children are um, required to have immunizations against um, tetanus and pertussis, primarily, which is a combination vaccine. Pertussis is an infection that is very rampant. We have it in this community all year round. Um, we have at least 40, if not 140 cases documented per year when we make the effort to, to do the test to see if that's the cause of a persistent cough. In children, it's called whooping cough. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very easy to prevent, and many children do, um, they don't miss school because they're not coughing from their whooping cough. Another vaccine that's required is um, the MMR twice to prevent them from measles, mumps, and rubella, um, which before we immunized, not only killed a number of children, but impaired a number of children, and at the very least kept them and their parents at home for one to two weeks which in our society would be a huge detriment in terms of the economics of our workforce. Um, because they were quarantined. Because they were at home. Gosh, what are we thing? doing to the families of <laughs> autistic kids? What is the economic impact? What's going to happen to these kids when they age out? Okay, let her finish. <laughs> um, they are all required to have uh, haemophilus influenza. See, I actually have the list. They are uh, vaccines. They are required to... Um, be immunized against hepatitis B. Um, they are recommended to be immunized against hepatitis A. Um, and they are all required to have um, the pneumonia vaccine, which is either, uh, at this point in time, is for 13 different pneumonia types uh, that can cause that. Um, the uh, vaccines as we use them, the children should have had all of their vaccines before they start school, and I have a couple of years ago, the immunization rates that put us at the bottom of the states in terms of our immunization rate and the number of illnesses that potentially are keeping our kids out of school. Okay, and where does Fort Collins and Poudre R1 stand? Does anyone know that? I do. Actually. Okay. There is a website, and, and I'm digging through my data here. There is a website now called uh, chalkboard.com. Mm -hmm. 
uh, where you can go in and see the, uh, the not just the exemption rates. What am I trying to think? The well, C it's word. the compliance rate, Thank you. but it's you not it. actually compliance with actually being immunized. It's compliance with turning in the paperwork. Exactly. But we have a very high rate. We're mm -hmm. in the high 90 percentile. Mm -hmm. There are two schools uh, in Larimer County that have a higher than 10 percent exemption rate. And I, I would be curious to know why, as a matter of fact. Oh, I know what they are. I know more than that. <laughs> yeah, one now, is I, done. I, can't, I don't know the source of my information, but Stove Prairie is 25% exemption. Polaris is 33%. Dunn is 16% exemption. And Global Academy is 17%. And it may be from that chalkboard. I'm sure mm -hmm. it is from I that have the same data. Yep. The lab okay. school elementary is 37% exemption rate. Okay, so yeah. now let's why talk about... Why are we asking why? <laughs> why we are yes, asking what, why. what is an exemption? An, an exemption is a parent says, I don't want to immunize my child for one or any of the vaccines, for any reason that they choose. Okay, so and there are also two other. Hmm? There are two other reasons, right? You don't have to be immunized. Religious. One is religious and the other one is immune deficiency. Is that right? Or a medical reason? They don't even need those. Parents can say, I don't want my kid immunized. Right, right. And that's what we have the majority of. And then what's the result? In terms of the incidence of infection? For me, it was healthier kids. My kids, I, I took the <laughs> religious exemption and uh, my kids weren't immunized until uh, seventh grade when they were required by the state to have certain immunizations to go into middle school. Never had a chronic ear infection. My kids are healthy to this day. Uh, they're hard working. They're not disabled. They were never ill. I never had to leave the workforce. I, why are so we waiting? You're so lucky. That's so wonderful for you. <laughs> it was. That's really... I, I will tell you, though, that in families that smoke, the incidence of ear infections is profoundly higher. I, why I, would you cure that I with vaccinations? That. Why wouldn't you just I'm, tell people I'm to stop smoking? You I would love for people yes. to stop smoking. But on the other hand, I was accountable for my health, my mm -hmm. maternal health, because what I was ingesting was being passed on to my children. And I'm, I was also responsible for their health. They grew up on sprouts instead of Cheerios. Okay, let's go on. Um, Katie, I think there was a survey that showed Colorado uh, had a, a very low participation rate in the survey, like 0.5% of 70,000 children. And I'm wondering, when I looked at this survey online, it showed many other states do 100%. Why do we survey so few children? Do you know which survey you're referring yeah. to? Uh, I think it was a CDC survey, 2012-2013. I don't know specifically which survey you're referring to. Okay. A lot of them are optional and parents get to opt in, um, but some of it can just be data. If we don't have a good system for collecting it, then we don't always report it. Is that the, state's, uh, the state responsibility usually, rather than the county? Usually the state oversees the reporting tools and each county participates. Okay, because what I saw was many states had 100% sure, partic participation. Sure, each state has their own setup normally. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Barbara, can I yes. respond to the previous question? Sure. When I hear you say, well, in families where people smoke, um, they get ear infections all the time, I understand that. And I see you see a lot of sick children, and you're, you work with a lot of families in maybe more difficult circumstances. To me, as a parent, it's difficult to have a one-size-fits-all policy <laughs> because that's where I feel like, well, I don't smoke, I eat healthily. Uh, of course, we are exposed to certain toxins in the environment that I cannot influence, but I do feel like it's not a one-size-fits-all situation, and that is part of the reason that I start being critical about it. Um, and I think that with me, a lot of other parents, because I understand there are situations where it's appropriate to go a certain direction, but there are also situations where it's not. And the people that choose to take the other route are very well informed. You say, well, they get their resources from the internet. I can guarantee you not everybody just searches the internet and bases themselves on that. I would find that irresponsible in my own situation with my kids. I go a little bit deeper, a little bit further across the ocean to find my resources, to be honest. So I, I feel, I, I wish that there was a different way of going about that than, uh, well, because they're in my practice and in your situation and a lot of where doctors work, so many sick, chil sick children, we should treat everybody the same way. That's 
You know, I guess part of it is we don't have a lot of control of what our children are exposed to when they're not in our homes. And, and that's where it's really pretty terrifying. When I have a child who, we had a case just a few years ago of a 14-year-old child who woke up fine. Before he left for school, he had a fever, so mom kept him home. He had a headache and didn't feel good. They made an appointment for 10 o'clock in the morning at the doctor's office. And by 10.30, he was dead from meningitis. That's very sad. You know, I don't have any way to protect that child other than to immunize that child. And in that interval, that's hard. That's not enough time to be able to even get antibiotics on board. But as long as we do not have the, the research across the board, we truly can say we cannot detect anything negative from immunizations. You can say, well, I specifically search, research autism. I specifically research the tamarazole. Or I specifically research this or that. To me, that's like we don't know for the, until our children have grown up to adults and really see what this list of 35 vaccinations does to their bodies until we really get a little bit of an idea what's causing all this you know, autoimmune disease, what's causing yes. all this increase of cancer. It might have nothing to do with the vaccinations. It might have a ton to do with it. We just don't know. It's a combined... Until we do the true research. And why don't we do the true research? I know they say, well, it's not ethical to have some children go have their vaccinations because we think that's great and some children not. There would be plenty of parents that would volunteer because plenty of parents feel like that's the right direction. So you could truly do that research and it's just not done. Maybe because it's not sponsored. Maybe, you know, there's a lot of money that goes around in this industry and in the industry, you know, the, the pharmaceutical industries. Those things are an issue in my opinion and I wish that it would be different because then I understand that you would have the true information the parents would be 100% informed and they could make a true decision. They might decide to vaccinate. I think vaccines can have a very necessary place in, in our lives uh, and for our children. I'm not going to debate that. Um, and I really highly respect the situation that you were put in and trying to save a child with meningitis. I, I understand that totally. But why don't we start looking at what's in vaccines? Um, we are greening up our planet. We are greening up our lives. We've greened up our water supplies and our landfills. Well, not really. I lied. <laughs> what we have actually done, thanks to the Clean Air and Water Act, is actually taken all those toxins uh, that were in um, uh, landfills, et cetera. They're called bio sludge, and you're buying them at Home Depot. They're okay, laid on I the think playgrounds. We're getting off the topic again. No, it, they've got mercury <laughs> in them. We're exposed to mercury. There's corn syrup in mercury. There's mercury and aluminum in vaccines. We need to really be paying attention to our environment because these are environmental issues. Vaccines are tied into it. Um, we I want to talk look about at getting mercury and aluminum out of vaccines. They're known neurotoxins. Okay. I want to talk about the philosophical ex exemption. Um, what does the Larimer County Health Department think about that? Is that a good thing? A bad no, thing? It's a bad thing. Well, we believe, you know, we believe in vaccination for everybody unless there's a specific exception, medical exception. Um, but and what kind of medical exceptions would you see? Very minimal. Um, so. In and what would what would be a medical if you have exemption? a child who's already had a strong reaction to a certain vaccine? I see. Or already has a an autoimmune deficiency for, uh -huh. for something bigger than just a vaccine reaction. Okay, and is that something you can tell on a child easily if they uh, can you tell ahead of time whether a child might Not have always. a bad reaction? No, and and we do look at it the same way as. The, the instance of reaction to that vaccine are so minimal compared to the herd immunity that we provide when we actually vaccinate all the children mm -hmm. um, before they enter school or daycare. Most side effects from the vaccines now, if any, are going to be some discomfort that may last for a couple of days, although not very often. Um, fever, a low-grade fever. Um, the, the younger the child may be more irritable. But the adverse effects that are serious from vaccines are far less in incidence, in, in, in cost, in hospitalization, in um, critical illness are, are profoundly less than they are from the disease itself. And okay. why did what Vaccine about? Court pay out $3 billion in, in a taxpayer's money for vaccine injury damages? Okay. Our government reports 12,000 visits Leslie, to the emergency room. we're getting off more. this topic. <laughs> well, I'm trying to keep, where, keep us on subject. 
Um, now, my question is that um, you've distracted me. I, uh, I want to talk about philo philosophical exemptions. And if you think they're not a good idea, and some people think they are a good idea, obviously, what happens to the child who may be uh, being treated for leukemia? I assume that child can't uh, have vaccines. Do you have much of that or very little of that or other illnesses that would be the same thing? We have a handful of them. We have, um, you know, that's a great example of where we have to rely on the other children in that environment being vaccinated. Somebody who's going through that kind of treatment can't be vaccinated. And so they're protected by everybody around them being protected. And we see issues where if that's not the case, if there isn't herd immunity in that environment, then you put that child who's going through leukemia at risk for getting that infection. Okay, and then do you put that child in a, do you check the children in the classroom or does the parent do it? Who, who checks that? That's a good question. Um, the schools have to report those rates and they're required for the that same school immunization records that we were talking about earlier. So it's, it's the school who has to be responsible for gathering that from the parents, but um, for us, a lot of it is educating the parents to realize what their immunization rates are and, you know, if they have a child at risk, what kind of environment they're at every day in school. Okay, Chantal? So for herd immunity to actually be effective, don't you need to have a vaccination rate of 65 to 70 percent? Actually, it needs to be closer to 90 percent. Close to 90 percent. So many schools have that 90 percent rate, mm -hmm. right? Not every school mm -hmm. in Fort Collins, obviously. How is it possible that in spite of that herd immunity that it's being called, then something like pertussis still goes around in also those schools? Well, many adults are not immunized against pertussis, and that is one of the illnesses that your immunity will wane over time. Those of us that have gotten boosters for pertussis in, in the, the more recent tetanus vaccines um, are protected from that, but that's not the majority of the population yet. Isn't pertussis also not one of the few vaccines that actually, or few illnesses that you can have the vaccination, you can still be a carrier of it. So even if you protect yourself against pertussis, it would not necessarily protect your leukemia infected neighbor? I'm not aware that pertussis has a very high carrier state. But it has some. You can have a carrier state for virtually anything. So, so but to me, that gives them, you know, I understand the situation with, you know, if it was my child with leukemia, you know, that would be a concern, of course, like how do I protect my child? But I don't know that it's a real protection by trying to create a herd immunity if there's not actual herd immunity. Like, I believe that polio is the same thing. Of course, polio doesn't happen very much in this country. It happens in my That's country, because actually. because we have a vaccine uh -huh. for it. No, it's it, a good example, though. But with polio also, you could be a, you can be a carrier. If it's not the oral vaccination, you can be a carrier without actually having symptoms of the, the uh, getting sick from it yourself. So at that point, you could still get somebody else sick without, you know, it's protecting... Minimal. There's, using a, the herd there's a difference between a carrier state and someone who is actively infected but not ill. Um, polio is kind of an interesting bird because we really don't have polio in this country uh, anymore. It's one of the few we actually have eradicated and has had extremely low incidence of of um, being brought back over from Europe. Um, most people who are carriers are not actively infected um, and they are not at a higher risk to infect other people. Um, How do you find out if someone's a carrier? If, if someone in their family were to get it? If someone was, if, if they had it in their family, we could potentially screen everybody in the family for it. Um, it's not an automatic. It would be something that they asked for, unless there were a lot of people in the community that we had a lot more than we usually do. Um, but pertussis is one of those that is easily prevented and easily treated. So economically, it hasn't been something that they put a lot of money into that research. But pertussis is very bad for newborns. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But if you could still be a carrier of pertussis when you don't get sick yourself, like say I'm a mom, I get my vaccination during pregnancy like that's recommended, mm -hmm. um, I still get in touch with somebody with pertussis and I don't actually get sick because I got my vaccination, but I'm a carrier, I can still transfer it to my newborn at that point, correct? Theoretically? Theoretically. Actually, I can't remember a case that we've actually been able to demonstrate that that was an issue. 
I, I don't know that the research has been done, though. <laughs> so, so. Right. And okay. then with pertussis, I feel like that's is also a, sp a one on its own because there is like pertussis and then there is paraprotussis, para if I understand the terminology correctly, mm -hmm. where as pertussis got suppressed and suppressed, the other strain that's not being vaccinated against gets more and more common. So to me, that's when, like, are you shifting the... The disease or? It isn't that it's more common, it's that there are, when we find those incidents, there are more of them that have the paraprotussis potentially than had the original. But it doesn't mean that there's more paraprotussis out in the community. It's not like we're suddenly generating or causing an epidemic of a different infection. Okay, now, do we have any questions in the audience? There's one. Please state your name and ask your question. John Metters. I understand that the measles in Disneyland was actually caused by people that actually got the vaccine. Is that the case? Does anybody in the panel understand? I don't know. I don't believe that's the case. We no. don't know. No, we don't no. know for sure. But it was a combination of vaccinated and unvaccinated people. And again, since it's a shedding vaccine and we don't know, certainly we don't know their immune status. It's only it's shedding in the first week after the vaccine. It's not lifelong. My other question. Well, actually, I got one more after this. The Amish in Pennsylvania, now, they don't get many shots. I mean, that would be a good case study. Am, am I right? I, I see you shaking your head, doctor. Mm -hmm. So they don't, the disease that they encounter is minuscule compared to the general society. Is that true? So they're not getting vaccinated with measles. I mean, I had measles. But mm -hmm. I'm, I was born in 1950. So I have a natural immunity to measles, is that correct? Since I, I had it before shot correct. and I never had mm -hmm. a shot. So the Amish, Amish people, why aren't people studying them? Why aren't you studying? They do use the Amish for control groups for a number of their studies. Yes. Keep in mind that in general, the Amish are a very secluded population. Mm -hmm. They are not interacting very often at all with other people who are not part of their closed communities. Um, and when they do, it's very limited exposure. So they eat well and they wash their hands, so that's what. And they don't go to places that have lots of people trafficking through, carrying other infections with them. Okay, that's my it. last question. Have you seen this chart? It's from the United States measles mortality rate, and <clears throat> it shows measles from 1900 over here on the left. You have seen this, this chart? Uh -huh. It shows that measles was going to, it was, it was eradicated in 2000, is that mm -hmm. correct? So it shows that it, it, in 1963, that's when they came out with the measles. It was just about gone, and there was no vaccine then. So that's, it, what does that show us, that the measles was gonna, just going to fizzle out just on its own? I think you can, um, you can look at the, Thank you. you have different data you're looking at. If that's mortality rate, yes. That also reflects that um, we had better treatment and better support systems for children with measles to take care of them when they got the disease. If they were, uh, if they became more critically ill or profoundly dehydrated, we had a lot more resources to help them recover than we did at the turn of the last century. So that particular graph relative to mortality rate is not the same thing as incidence or the number of people who got measles. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question? Please state your name and then your question. Yes, my name is Donna, and I know this might sound silly, but I don't understand just because you believe, the health department, that my child should be vaccinated, I sure went out and get a vaccine. What happened to scientific studies? What happened to independent studies? I haven't seen any independent studies out there. So just because you believe, what about my human rights and I don't believe? So we don't necessarily state our own personal Larimer County Health Department beliefs. Ours come from CDC and the recommended studies and all the research that's out there. We are doing the best to our ability to protect public health and the population at large. Um, so that's part of what we're talking about is the you know, personal belief versus the public health. Um, what we're trying to do is protect the general population. So when, when do the independent studies 
come in to where the people that are examining what you're putting out there saying, you know, this is good, this is wholesome, where's the other side that's away from your vaccine companies, your CDC companies, you know, the people that put this out there, where's the independent people? Oh, I can't find any of those studies anywhere. There is a website, uh, an, a nonprofit organization that's run uh, by a foundation uh, called the Children's Medical Research Safety Institute, and they have a very excellent list of uh, research done by independent uh, scientists uh, on aluminum and on mercury in, in vaccines. Uh, the research is coming out more and more. Um, you, and, and we just have to look for it and to, to be educated and educate ourselves. Okay. You know, you do keep focusing on the mercury. And the, there's very clear data that there's virtually no mercury in any of our vaccines except the multivials for flu right now and haven't been for the past 25 years. And when they did the autism rates for those who got vaccinated before we took thimerosal out of the vaccines, which the mercury uh, is the component of it, and afterwards there was absolutely no difference in the incidence of autism. Thirdly, the amount of mercury in all of our vaccines combined, even before we took it out of the thimerosal, is less than in one can of tuna. It's okay, so let's go through can your metabolic system. Can I respond to that? Yes. Thank you. It's on the FDA website that they said in 2001 they started working with pharmaceutical companies to take mercury out of vaccines. That process is not yet complete. Um, government right there. Um, heavy metals are cumulative, summative, and additive. What does that mean? It means even if we have a vaccine that has an EPA standard, uh, level of, of safety, we keep adding to that and adding to that and adding to that, and that body burden, which is being weakened over time, is becoming more toxic. Add to that amalgams, dental fillings. Oh, let's not go there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Do doctor, what do you consider si good sites for the public to look at? You mentioned one or two. Tell us two or three more so the people in the audience can know what you at least think are reliable sites. I'll give you the list that I have here. There is uh, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia has a number of educational resources that are done independently of the CDC and all of the pharmaceutical companies. Um, the CDC.gov has a lot of information. For those that don't want to trust the CDC, there are a lot of others, um, immunize.org. ColoradoImmunizations.com, ImmunizeForGood.com, VoicesForVaccines.org, the CDC state um, website on the Colorado Department of Health um, are all very reasonable and can give you, they actually have information about um, the issues that are brought up that people are challenging and where they're getting the data to reflect as much information as we have that's available to be as balanced as possible on a number of these sites. Okay, good. Can I ask a question? Sure. At which point do you think it's gonna be enough? When are we done adding to the vaccination list? Is it gonna be like that the next generation will have 50 vaccinations or 60, maybe 75? I don't know, we keep coming up with new diseases. Yeah, <laughs> mutations. Take, take <laughs> HIV, we don't have a vaccine for that and that's been an issue in this country alone for the past 20 years. I think there are 300 in the pipeline. There are lots of them coming down and they're not gonna release them until they have good data for that to protect them. Take, uh, take Gardasil, the HPV vaccine, very good data that um, even though it protects against only two of the four um, common causes of cancer, uh, that they have a huge statistical decrease in the incidence of HPV-related cancer. And interestingly enough, when we first advocated for that vaccine to protect our children before they were sexually active, um, we were able to demonstrate that simply by doing pap smears alone, we had done a lot to decrease the incidence of cervical cancer. What we discovered in the process, though, is that 90% of our head and neck cancers are now also caused by the same HPV viruses. And in an ability to protect, it's, it's a wonderful vaccine that protects against cancer, 
Um, and it's very effective. It's been out for almost 20 years now, and they have yet to show anyone who's been vaccinated with that to, be, to develop cancer so far with either of those um, viral pathogen types. And okay, I and I think we have, I have one more question <laughs> from the audience. Hi, my name is Stacy Lynn. This question is for Ms. Botha. I was wondering, you had mentioned earlier something about a large payout. Can you explain what that payout was for and who actually paid um, whom for what? There is a vaccine compensation court, and I'm not going to go into details about that, but every uh, vaccine that's sold, the government gets a cut. Uh, it goes into a fund to pay for vaccine injuries. Uh, we watch that closely. There are a lot of cases that are denied, but the fact is $3 billion has been paid out. That money is um, sitting there, um, and there are many more people ap applying. It's Vaccine Compensation Court. It's headed up by a special master and, and not a judge. Uh, it's, it's pretty secretive, and it's very hard to get compensation, and a lot of times people's limits on claiming their vaccine injury uh, run out before they even hear about the vaccine as compensation court. And as a patient, you cannot actually take the company to court because they are, right. what do you call it? Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it, we can't hold the pharmaceutical companies liable for injuring our children for vaccines. That, that went out in the immunity. 80s, yeah. right, 1986, I believe. Gardasil is a very dangerous vaccine. Okay. I, I will agree to disagree with you on that. <laughs> yes. Okay. I think you have really covered this issue pretty well. And if, oh, we have one more question. Okay, go ahead. And then we're going to take final remarks. Bill Mawinney, and I wanted to address this to the doctor. You had mentioned there was 140 cases of whooping cough in Fort Collins this year, or? No, I didn't say that we oh. had 140 cases this year. We've had as many of that that have actually been documented over the last 20 years. But okay, I was just wondering what the percentage of non-vaccinated with the vaccinated, how that actually broke down, do you have? We don't know, because most of the time when we have patients with a chronic cough, we will evaluate without necessarily doing a pertussis test, and we'll treat empirically, and usually they get better, or okay. we'll do other things to evaluate. But the, the diagnostic studies to, to diagnose pertussis is not very common or not nearly as frequent as we expect that we actually have pertussis in the community. Okay, and then one uh, general comment, um, and, and this is for anybody that might want to respond. I, I've heard there's a, um, a revolving door between the uh, pharmaceuticals and the medical profession and it seems like there's a built-in bias then or, or a conflict of interest. The, the more the studies that, you know, can be manipulated so that more drugs can be sold, do you have any um, comments on that particular issue where, the, where, where people that work for the medical profession then go into the pharmaceutical industry and vice versa, and it, and it just helps sell a lot more vaccinations and drugs? I would say to you that I have been in this community for 25 years. I've known hundreds, if not thousands, of physicians. I don't know any of them that have gone into the pharmaceutical company. Um, I think that that is an extreme minority. Um, I don't believe that most of us are advocating for the health of our children and the people of our communities by immunizing to prote protect them against diseases that can kill them, that we are doing that on a bias that somehow there's a kickback from some pharmaceutical company because I can assure you that none of us are getting it. <laughs> when we are recommending vaccines is to protect our children from diseases that we have seen kill them. Period. Okay, now I <laughs> want to go to your last, your last comments. We're approaching our, uh, we have, what, four minutes for each person. One, I mean, one minute for each of you. <laughs> and the question is, for your final remarks, tell us what you, would th what you think would be the best policy for Colorado regarding vaccines for personal health and public health. And if you disagree with that, you don't think we should have any vaccines, you're welcome to say that. Why don't we start here and go to the end? I think Colorado, especially if you, say, if you see how many people are not necessarily agreeing with the vaccination program, should maybe advocate for a more independent study, um, maybe on a national level, so that we can actually find out what does it do and what does it not do that we think it does. I think that's going to be an important role. It would be great if we could actually take that on. Okay. 
Um, for us, definitely our perspective is less of the exemptions. You know, we have a big vaccination gap. We're, like you said, second to last or last in the country. Um, for us, we just like to make sure that it's a little bit more difficult to take that personal exemption um, and to hopefully raise our vaccination immunization rates in Colorado. Okay, Leslie, one minute. I strongly believe in having medical freedom and medical rights and choices and working with our health practitioners in determining what's best for our child, and I will continue to stay on that platform. Thank you. Okay. Donna. I wouldn't argue with that position. We just take a different lens. <laughs> um, I think it's very important that we as parents are responsible for the health of our children. That includes good and healthy nutrition. Um, that includes protecting them as much as we can against injury and harm and infection. That includes not exposing them to toxins like tobacco smoke or marijuana, um, to lead paint or anything else. Um, I think that the more that we can make sure that the information is readily available and easy to find so people can make well-educated decisions um, and can continue to be as responsible as possible to help protect our children from things that can be easily prevented and pr protect them from harm. Okay, very well, I good. I can't argue with that either. And, <laughs> I, and I have one comment that uh, just happened, let's see, uh, Thursday, April 16th. The state health department passed new rules to strengthen school policies. Effective July 2016, parents seeking non-medical exemptions will be required to submit them at each age when recommended vaccines are due for pre-K and annually from kindergarten through 12th grade. And that was done by the state mm -hmm. health department. So there is some change there. Okay, thank you for your lively discussion uh, to our panelists and thank you the audience for your questions. This Cross Currents program will be rebroadcast at various times during the month. Please check your local listings for exact dates and times. Copies of recent Cross Currents programs are available for checkout at all three branches of the Poudre River Library District and at the Loveland Public Library. The video is available at the League of Women Voters website, which is lwv-larimercounty.org. Thanks again for tuning in.